Well, welcome back to our next installment of the Literal Genesis series, where, if you don't know by now, I, I hope you do, that here we try to hold firmly to Scripture and loosely to theories. And I'm all the time being asked, well, wh what do you mean by that, Kim? Can you give me an, an example? And uh, I'll give you one that I haven't used yet, at least I don't think I've used it, but if we think about this idea of Darwinian evolution, um, particularly the, the neo-Darwinian synthesis, you know, the more modern twist uh, on Dar Darwin's theory, and we, we think about how the media portrays it and how typically in science portrays it as so solid, it's so well understood. We, we know this is how it happened. We know how these single-celled creatures evolved into to human beings over eons of time. However, in 2016, there was a meeting of the, the Royal Society, which, by the way, this organization has been meeting for a long time. In fact, uh, Newton himself chaired these, these meetings for 24 years. I mean, it, it's a very prestigious organization of scientists. It doesn't get much more prestigious than that. And in 2016, their topic was to meet to discuss the problems with neo-Darwinian evolution and how they might be overcome. Now you might be thinking, problems? What, what problems? Well, if you're a Christian that has discounted the history in Genesis in order to go with what the scientists say, some scientists, not all, about how life arose, then guess what? You're, you're in a pause right now and you don't even know it. But the, the point is, when and if they should come up with something that's more satisfying, you're going to have to change your views on biological evolution. But if you just hold firmly to Scripture to begin with, you never have to go through that. And I believe James tells it better than me. He talks about the waves of the sea being tossed around and driven by the wind. And, and he's talking about doctrine. Every new little wind of doctrine that comes in, some Christians go with it and they go with it and they go with it. Um, we just need to take a step back and be solid in how we approach things. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the, the age of things, particularly the age of the universe. I get asked this question a lot. And it is an important question. So just kind of let you know the, the order of things. We'll talk about evidences for the, a, a universe that's old, uh, evidences for a universe that is young. We'll talk about why it matters. Uh, a lot of people say, I really don't care. And I'm, I kind of fall into that category. It doesn't really matter to me how old things are, but, but what does the Bible say? Does it give us any, any hint, any clue? Um, and then we'll talk about why it matters. Again, we'll go to Scripture uh, intermittently throughout and then I want to wrap it up with how I view this from a biblical standpoint that I think answers all the, the questions about the ages of things. And without further ado, so is the, is the universe old? Is the universe young? When it comes to understanding an age of something, you might be surprised to know that there isn't just a standard test you can apply. And this applies to almost anything you can think of. Uh, how old am I? How old are human beings? How old are our animals? How old are trees and rocks? How old is the universe? And there's not just a scientific test that we can, we can do like, like measuring the circumference of a tree or measuring the height of an object. That's, that's too easy. In every case, we find there's really no scientific test. In fact, ages must be derived. They must be calculated. Oh, that's kind of a bummer, right? Uh, wouldn't it be nice if there was just a scientific test, like a litmus test, like, oh, okay, well, the universe is X amount of years old, there's no debate, that's it, done. Mm, no, not so much. Uh, in all ages, in all age calculations, there are assumptions. In many cases, these are unprovable assumptions that you have to go into your work uh, before you can even do it. And, and I may use this illustration throughout, so I'll, I'll kind of bring it up now, but... Let's say, because people say, well, isn't math involved? And, and math is, is, is very, very sound, very solid. And, and, well, absolutely, math is involved. So you might think of math as like a, like a black box with a handle on it. And the math inside, the math is just math. It's very solid equations. But on one side of the box, you have to feed something into it before you can turn the crank. And it's that information that you feed into it, that's the variability. That's the assumptions. And, and as I say, many times these are unproven. So depending on where you start with your assumptions, you can put it into the math box, turn the crank, you'll get different answers. Make sense? Okay, well, this is, this is also a bummer because we all look at things differently. Uh, you know how, how it is. Two people can look at the same 
scene that's happening on a street corner and you go ask interview both of them separately and you get you get different variations of of the uh, things that are eyewitness right it's just the way we are as human beings okay so let, let's kind of run briefly through the four different ways that we can come up with an age or we can derive an age for the age of the universe and one has to do with this h here in the middle of these balloons it's the hubble constant and Hubble hopefully sounds familiar to you. We, there's a telescope named after, after Hubble out there in space. Sent us tremendously beautiful pictures of space. We've learned so much from the images received from that telescope. But the idea has to do with the Hubble constant. And that's one of those variables that's on the outside of that math box. Okay, Whatever H is, whatever that constant is, it could be different. We feed it into the box, we turn the crank, we get an H of the universe. And we'll, we'll go into a little more detail here in a moment. Uh, the other is looking at the cosmic microwave background radiation. I know that's, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Uh, we can call it CMB for short. But scientists have discovered um, oh, somewhere around the year 2013 this this, uh, this radiant temperature that we can measure throughout the universe that seems fairly consistent. The idea here is that this is the early temperature fluctuation from right after the Big Bang. Now, I, I don't believe that. I think there's other ways that we can look at this, the CMB, but this is one way that they use. And, they, and you look at these kind of light areas and dark areas, and, and so there's a temperature fluctuation between the two. We'll, we'll talk more about it in a moment, but um, again, they plug in some variables on the left, they put it into the, our math box, turn the crank, and they come out with an age. The other way is looking at globular clusters. Um, this is pretty, pretty logical. We try to find the oldest stars in the universe. Uh, makes, makes logical sense, right? The universe has to be older than the oldest star is the premise for that. And then finally, um, Scripture. Does Scripture even talk about the age of the universe? Unfortunately, not directly, right? Like any other age calculation in Scripture, we have to derive it. We have to calculate it. So these are the four ways, uh, primarily, that we can come up with an age for the universe. And let's start taking a look at these. So first, we'll start with, with this. Is the universe old? Well, guess what? There's evidence that sure looks like the universe is old. So what is that evidence? And I want to start with Scripture here, which may be an odd place to start, but... I want to start here because I want to concentrate on this word stretch and be thinking about this kind of throughout uh, the talk today. In Job 9.8, it says, Who alone, by the way, who is God? Job is talking about God. Who alone stretches out the heavens and walks on the waves of the sea? Well, that's pretty obvious. I don't know of anybody else that can walk on water except God himself. Uh, and, he, and this idea about stretching is what I want to focus on, stretching. So... If you stretch something out and you do it at a consistent rate, let's say that uh, I have a piece of bubble gum that's, that can be stretched infinitely. Okay, that's, that's impossible, but let's say I have that and I'm stretching it at a rate of an inch an hour. After two hours, there's an inch longer this way, there's an inch longer that way. After um, you know, another couple of hours, there's more inches. So I, I can measure this over time and it makes sense that I should be able to go backwards in time, or as I like to say, rewind the clock, right? Based on that constant measure of stretch and go back to a point where I feel like, okay, this, this it must have been where it started. Okay, this is the time when I think the gum started being stretched. Very logical, isn't it? Makes, makes a lot of sense. And when we apply this to the universe, we can think the universe um, as being on the surface of the balloon. Now, th this is for an illustration, okay? There, there is debate among cosmologists on exactly what the structure of the universe is, but this is one idea. One idea that it's on the surface of the balloon. And what happens when we inject air in this balloon? Let's say I have a balloon with, with a bunch of dots on it, and these dots represent galaxies. Well, as I inflate the balloon, the more air that comes in, the surface expands on the balloon. And what happens with my dots? They, they get further apart, don't they? And I put more air into the balloon, the surface expands even more, and I, I get galaxies that are even further apart. So have you ever heard of the expansion of the universe? This is, this is kind of what that is. And all this, this, this rate of expansion depends on the Hubble constant. Now, don't let the word constant fool you. It has changed throughout the years. 
uh, it's a variable, right? It's a variable. You feed into that math box and turn the crank and you get out an H. So the idea is that over time, just like that gum, it's being expanded or stretched out. Now we'll get into a little more details in a moment about what exactly is expanding and how fast it's expanding, but this is the idea. Now before we apply our, our rewinding the clock idea to this, I, I don't want to overlook the fact that this makes it so easy when we talk about the universe and oh, we have such and such many galaxies with so and so many stars and let's not gloss over that, right? This is very important. So let's think about a galaxy. Uh, this is the, the Milky Way. I, I showed this recently to a group of people and afterwards someone asked me, how did we get a picture of our own galaxy? Uh, well, this, this is a rendition, right? Based on what we think we see from the inside. This is what we think it looks like from the outside. We've, we've never been outside of our own galaxy, of course. Now we are, we are here, that you probably already knew that, right? Um, actually, it's, it's very confusing depending on which view you're looking at it. Some, some have us over here, some have us over here. Regardless, we're in here. And our solar system is, is about halfway between the galactic center and, and the edge, the spiral edge. We're about halfway in there. And we're here. So we need to understand the scale of just the Milky Way, okay, our, our galaxy that we live in. Now inside of here, there's a solar system. There's lots of them. Our solar system is here. And I don't know if it, you may not have been alive in 1977, I was, but in, in that year we launched a couple of spacecraft, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, and we, we sent them on a mission. And primarily we wanted to, to get pictures of the outermost planets uh, in our solar system. Well, it, it did that. And in fact, it started out its journey here in 1977. It traveled. Now, if you think you're a frequent traveler, you're not. Vo Voyager 1 has us all beat. A million miles a day at 35,000 miles an hour it roughly equals a million miles a day. And so it's been traveling a million miles a day for 46 years. That's a lot of miles. And I don't know what kind of benefits Voyager 1's going to get for all that travel, but um, well, where is it? How far has it gone? Is it outside of the galaxy? Is it all on the other side of the galaxy? Well, if you think about this pinpoint on this arrow, it's barely left that point. A million miles a day for 46 years. The next question is, well, is it beyond our solar system? No. It would have to travel another 30,000 years to get outside of the influence of our sun. Is our, is our galaxy big? Well, in terms of galaxies in the universe, scientists believe we have a medium-sized galaxy. Yeah, there are galaxies even bigger. And when you think 30,000 years at a million miles a day just to get outside of our solar system, the next question you might ask is, well, how many solar systems are in the Milky Way? Scientists estimate, because we don't know, between 100 billion and 400 billion solar systems like ours in the Milky Way. Is it a big place? It's unbelievably big. It's, it's almost unimaginable, just one galaxy. Now try to imagine there's more galaxies in the universe like this. And it, the closest one is so far away, we'll, we'll never be able to get there to see it. We cannot send a probe that far. And if we take a picture like this of the nighttime sky, you can see kind of these, these flat disk images things. Those are galaxies like the Milky Way. Remember that probe having to travel 30,000 years to get outside of our own solar system in our own galaxy and look at all these galaxies. This happens to represent about the size of a grain of sand. You could hold up at the nighttime sky, block out the nighttime sky with a grain of sand. Behind that grain of sand, this is what you would see. How many grains of sand can you fill the nighttime sky with? It's, it's almost incomprehensible the size of the universe and the number of galaxies that are in it. Um, it just well, it makes me feel a couple of things. One, it makes me feel small, very, very small. And the other, it makes me comprehend a little bit how big the Creator is. It's, it's, it's unbelievable and it's beautiful. The, everywhere we turn our, our telescope, it's just beautiful. Now let's, let's go back from, from this view here, go back into a, a galaxy mode and just think about the number of stars that are in a galaxy. 
Um, well, how many galaxies are there? This number has also changed throughout the years. Has anyone heard of the James Webb Space Telescope? Well, we, we had some ideas before the first images from that telescope, and now those ideas have, have changed a little bit. But, you know, scientists used to believe that there were, you know, maybe 200 billion galaxies in the visible universe. We'll talk more about what that means, the visible universe, here in a moment. Well, that, that's a lot. That's, that's unbelievably a, a large amount of galaxies. Well, now scientists think it's more in the upwards of two, three, four trillion galaxies. The universe just all of a sudden got a whole lot bigger thanks to the James Webb. Uh, and, it's, and its ability to see further and further, more, fur, more far than we've ever seen uh, in, in, the, in our past. Uh, but if you take a look at one galaxy with all the stars in it, uh, and even in our own Milky Way, there could be up to 400 billion stars. It's unbelievable. Take it back to Scripture for a moment, Isaiah 40, 26, where it says, Raise your eyes on high and see who has created these stars, the one who brings out their multitude by number. He calls them all by name. Because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. I don't know how many stars there are in the entire universe, but if we have trillions of galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars each, that's a big number. But it's not bigger than our God, is it? I'd, so I just wanted to kind of talk about the scale of things before we, you know, it's kind of glossed over. Oh, okay, the universe is like the surface of the balloon. It, that just doesn't do it justice, does it? So getting back to our, our analogy here, if the universe is expanding, now exactly what is expanding? N nobody really knows. Um, the galaxies do seem to be moving away from one another. Uh, not that they can measure the speed and say, oh, um, you know, Andromeda, well, Andromeda is a bad example. It's coming closer to us. But all the other galaxies seems like they're moving far away. It's not like that we're measuring the speed. We're actually, we're looking at the light. And we see that that light is stretched. As it goes away from us, it gets stretched out. And as it stretches out, it moves towards the, the redshift end of the visible or invisible spectrum. Uh, well, the visible light spectrum. So they look at this redshift, and that's how they, they think they're determining distance and, and speed and that sort of thing, but that's, there's other interpretations of redshift that we won't get into today, but let's just say that's the right interpretation. And it looks like these galaxies are receding away from us. We can measure, based on redshift, the, the expansion rate of whatever it is that's expanding, because these galaxies can't be moving away themselves because the further away we get out, we, we, get, we find that things are moving faster than the speed of light. And that's, physics doesn't make that possible. You can't have anything faster than the speed of light than light. So something, the surface area, whatever it is, is expanding. And if we rewind the clock and we, we kind of calculate, well, it's, it's this big today, it's expanding at this rate. How far can we go back into the past where it's, it's all together? And that calculation is about 12 to 14 billion years. Very logical, right? Like stretching out the bubble gum and then counting backwards to get to where when it was in a small, small state. Uh, very logical. Nothing wrong with that at all. Um, except your starting assumptions. But we'll get there in a moment. Okay, what, what else can we, we can look at the cosmic microwave background radiation. And, and again, this is measuring temperature. Um, this recently discovered, about 2013, and there's, there's temperature fluctuations. They're very, very minor. Okay, so let's say that the brighter areas are warmer and the, the blue areas are, are, are cooler. And they look at these, these fluctuations, these differences in the temperature, and they plug in some variables, put it in the math box, and crank it out, and they get an age uh, to find out, well, what, what do they think is the time frame that these, these differences in temperature could occur? Okay, makes sense. It's still a math problem. You still have a, a solid math box. You have some assumptions here. We'll talk about more in a moment. You plug it in and, and you get an age. Now, what kind of temperatures are we talking about? We're talking about minus 454 degrees Fahrenheit. It's very, very cold. What, what differences? Like plus or minus 5 degrees. So we're not, when I say warmer areas, we're not talking about warm. <laughs> okay, we're just talking about differences in cold, if you're going to look at it that way but it's detectable. We can pick this up and we can measure it. Now, are there other interpretations of what this might be? Because 
Again, this is thought to be leftover radiation from just moments after the Big Bang. Okay? Yes, there are other interpretations. Um, it's not the only one, but let's just go with that one because that's mainstream. And, and, and if you're familiar with CMB, you, you, you kind of know that this is what uh, is generally believed. Okay, so what kind of unknowns are we talking about? Because measuring an expansion rate and rewinding the clock, that makes logical sense. Measuring the fluctuations in, in the microwave background radiation and determining how long it took for them to reach that state, that kind of makes sense as well. Well, one thing is, what about the expansion rate itself? Has it always been constant? How would we know? It appears to be constant today. How do we know that sometime in the past, because we're talking about 13.8 billion years or so, how do we know it's always been that constant rate? By the way, nobody knows why or how it's even expanding. Imagine the power. I, I just briefly touched on the, the size of the universe. What kind of power would it take to stretch that fabric out? Unbelievable power. Well, they call that power dark energy, by the way. It's dark because it's invisible, it's not detectable, no one can see it, you can't bring it in the lab, you can't test it. Uh, but they believe it's there, nonetheless, because something has to be expanding the universe. Well, this is, this is unknown, okay? We can assume that it's always been constant, but we don't really know. We can't really prove it because the, the past is the past. We can't redo the past. Um, the current density of the universe. So Big Bang prediction would predict that there is, is less dense matter in the universe because it's all being spread out and becoming further and further apart. Yet new discoveries, again with the James Webb, shows that that's not the case. There's even more universes. Um, what, well, we'll talk about what they were hoping to find here in a moment, but it wasn't what they found. Uh, there's even more galaxies. I said universes. There's more galaxies. Um, I only know of one universe, so don't, don't get too excited about the multiverse thing, right? So the density of the universe is something that's it's in flux. We don't know. Uh, but that, that's one of those variables outside of that math box you got to feed in before you can turn the crank. Uh, here's two variables, right? Another one is the, the composition or the structure of the universe. Is it curved, like that surface area of the balloon? Or is it flat? Now, I, I know, there's probably a joke in there about flat Earth somewhere in there, but um, yes, the, there's, there's two competing theories uh, with cosmologists, and it's looking like more and more the flat universe is gonna win out because uh, the math works out better with the flat universe. So I don't know, can, can we get ourselves outside of the universe to look in to see is it curved, is it flat? Well, no, we can't do that. So we, we really don't know. That's another variable outside of the math box and that is going to affect the outcome of the age. Uh, then there's uh, the Hubble constant, or the cosmological constant itself, um, developed by Edwin Hubble in 1929, based on redshift. And this number has changed, we'll see in a moment, throughout the years. But um, it's interesting, you take this Hubble constant, and if you, if you raise it, if you give it a higher value, which means it's expanding faster, then the universe turns out to be younger. If you give the Hubble constant a lower value, it means it's expanding slower, crank it in, it turns out to be older. Um, see what I'm saying? So the, don't get hung up on the math. The math is math, right? But there are assumptions that we feed into the math in order to get a value on the other side. And these are things that just, these are hard. These are hard, right? We're just, we're just little humans on this little speck of dust in this massive universe and we're trying to figure this out. Okay, another way we can tell the, or calculate or derive the age of the universe is looking at globular clusters. Uh, shown here is the, the Hercules globular cluster. It, it's this, this faint little fuzzy, looks like a bunch of dots there. You can see this with your naked eye on, on a moonless night. Um, it's really hard to look directly at it. You kind of got to move your eyes left and right once, once you find it, but, but you, you can see it, you can spot it. And this, this cluster of stars is, is about a million stars. Now, it's not a galaxy, it's just a cluster of stars. The idea here is that these stars all formed at the same time, shortly after the Big Bang. And so if we can look inside here and try to figure out what the oldest star is inside of there, then we know the universe must be slightly older than that. Makes sense, doesn't it? 
Here's the more zoomed in picture of the Hercules cluster. It's just stunning, isn't it? Um, the better we make our telescopes and the higher res images we bring back, it's just, it's just beautiful. Um, the skies are definitely telling of the handiwork of God when you view it that way. Okay, so how can we tell how old a star is? This gets pretty tricky, but we, we look at our sun. Our sun is about a, a medium-sized sun. It's interesting. We live in a, a medium-sized galaxy with a medium-sized sun in our solar system. It's kind of kind of like Goldilocks, right? Uh, there have been books written about this, of just how, how Goldilocks-like our universe and, and our solar system is. It's, it's really more than coincidence, I believe. But So here's our sun, and we think... Again, we can only look at what we see t happening today, but we think our sun will burn out after about 9 billion years. Well, it's already 4.5 billion years old, so it's, it's half, half its life is, is, is uh, taken up, right? It's, its internal ability to, uh, to fusion and generate heat takes about 9 billion years. So if we take a sun that's half the size of our sun, it's like an economy car. It can go longer on its fuel. It'll, it takes about 20 billion years. Now, obviously, no one's been around to observe, you know, suns burning out uh, billions of years. But again, based on, on math and calculations, it looks like these smaller suns take longer to burn out. So the bigger suns, say ones that are twice our size of our sun, um, they're like SUVs and they go through their gas quick. So they, they, they don't stick around very long. Okay, so the idea is looking at these globular clusters and if we see clusters that have mostly small suns, then that's a clue, logically, that that's an old cluster. And then we can start looking at the light and the brightness of these, these stars to determine how far away they are and, and, and calculate how old they are. Um, are there assumptions in there? Yeah, uh, they're, they're hard. Again, the math, the math is math, right? Now, they don't always get the math right, don't get me wrong, but the math is pretty solid. What do we don't know? We don't know the history of the burnout rate. We only see what we can see happening today. We can't look into the past to see if that burnout rate has changed or, or fluctuated. If there's any event that causes it to change, we have no idea. Uh, what else? The exact distance to the cluster. Redshift is not always easy. You know, we, we think about, well, if, uh, if we stretch the light out so far, and they give them numbers like a redshift of 7, redshift of 8, redshift of 10. And the higher the redshift, the further away or the faster away, faster it's speeding away from us it is. Um, but then there are wrinkles in, in what we see. We, we see quasars outside of uh, galaxies, for example, that we think came from the galaxies, but yet the redshifts are vastly different. Um, the, it's really... It's really not as easy as you think. Um, you know, determining the exact distance to the star, the one star out of those millions that we're trying to figure out how far away it is. And then the other thing is, uh, you know, ignorance of stellar evolution. What does that mean? Has anyone ever seen a star form? I did an interesting experiment recently. Uh, you probably heard of ChatGPT and, and BARD and those other things. These AI, these large language models, right? We can ask it questions and... Um, I, I asked two different models, I won't say which one said what, but I asked one model, ha have scientists ever seen or observed a star form? And one of them said, no, uh, no scientists has ever seen a star form, yet we, we infer based on, here's, here's a list of evidences, right? The other one I asked said, yes, we see stars forming all the time, and here's the different stages that scientists have observed stars going through. Way different answers. So I throw that in there parenthetically to say, if you're using one of those large language models to do your homework, um, you might want to be careful. Double check your work because um, they can they can vary uh, a lot. But but the truth is, no one has ever seen a star form. In fact, the the Big Bang predicts certain types of stars, you know, to come out, and and there's just the predictions aren't there. We don't see them. We we see uh, stars like our sun, uh, but we don't see these early um, these generation one stars, if you will, that's supposed to be predictable from, from new star evolution. So we don't know. We, we guess, we hypothesize. We think they come out of uh, these nebula, these, these gas, gaseous nurseries, you know, in, in the universe, but I don't know. No one's ever seen it. Well, all we do is speculate. So, so again, we have unknowns. We plug what we think those are into the box of math, and then we spit out an age on the other side. Um, okay, so 
But what about the young universe? Is there any evidence at all that the universe is young? And I would say yes. Uh, there are lots of scientific evidences that throw wrinkles into the old age analogies, right? Again, it's those variables on this side of the box. And depending on what you plug those variables, you're going to get a different, different age out. Um, here's seven evidences, just seven. I could have came up with more uh, that show the universe might not be as old as, as some think it is. And here's seven evidences about the earth. And, and, and these aren't easy problems to solve. But we're not going to talk about these because we're, we're going to look at this from a biblical perspective, okay? Um, there's lots of controversy here. And again, those variables, it really depends on where you start and what your worldview is. So I've talked about some of these before in this series, but let's go take a look at Scripture. So beginning with Adam, who very clearly Adam was the first human being. I don't think anybody would disagree with that all the way up today. So here's our timeline. If we look at Scripture and we look at those those things that nobody really likes to read, those, those genealogies. I, I remember I was 11, 12 years old. I was reading through Matthew. I just wanted to skip that part. Like, why is this even in here? Or I'd read Genesis. I'm like, Genesis chapter 5. Why is this in here? This is so boring. Uh, it was a great story up until that point. Action, adventure, you know, creation and sin. And, and now all of a sudden, so-and-so begat so-and-so. I mean, that's a word we don't use today, but... Um, you know, all these children being born, and here's, it, it didn't matter to me. I didn't really like it. But now, this is very, very important because if we add up the genealogies that we get, and I'm giving you an approximation here. That's, that's what this little tilde means, right? Approximately. So this is an easy way to remember it. If Adam very, was the first living human being, uh, we can count genealogies up to Abraham. That's about 2,000 years. From Abraham to Jesus, about 2,000 years. From Jesus to today, about 2,000 years. This is pretty simple math. I like this kind of math, right? We add these up, what do we get? We get uh, approximately 6,000 years old. Make sense? Now, just like any age calculation or derivation, there, there are assumptions involved in this as well. It's not clear-cut, as a lot of people think. Uh, why is that? Why isn't it an exact figure? Why do I have this uh, approximation here? Well, let's give you one example. In Genesis 5.3, it says, When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. Okay, how old was Adam when he had Seth? 130 years. How old was Adam when he had Cain or Abel? It doesn't matter. right? He, this is our bookend. Adam was day zero up to 130 years, and he had set. That's the important thing we need to remember. Well, is this an exact age? Does the Bible mean that he had just turned 130, or he was 130 years old in 11 months and about to turn 131? Uh, how do we know? Well, we don't know. So you see the variability? Now, you might be saying, oh, okay, 11 months. Is that a big deal? Uh, I don't think so. But, but there's an assumption in there, right? He's 130 years. I don't know exactly where that was. Scripture doesn't tell us. It doesn't need to. That's a detail that it just doesn't need to put in there. In fact, that would be a little strange if that detail was in there. So what we can do, and I'm, gonna go, I'm not going to go through all this, but we can take these genealogies, starting with Adam to, to Shem to Abraham, and all the way up to Exodus 12, um, and we can, we can add these up with some variability in there, right? The, this un, unknowns of exactly how old people were. And it's not always about the genealogies. The Bible talks about um, specific uh, time frames as well. But in Exodus 12, we have the, the exodus or the, the leaving of the, the Israelites from, from Exodus. Then we pick it up in 1 Kings 6, which gives us a very specific time frame about a certain king and a certain year of his reign. Um, very, very nice that that's in there because it makes it flow very, very smoothly. In fact, uh, we, we read about the Solomon, the destruction, you know, of the temple. Uh, then we pick it up in, in Judges through the exile. And again, looking at the reign of the Judges and adding this time up, it, it's not rocket science. It, it's actually pretty simple. But, but again, there's some variability in there. There's some unknowns before we plug that into our, 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 our simple math box where we're just doing uh, addition, right? And then we, we, we get up to the birth of Christ, and from there, uh, I don't think there's any dispute. 
right? Because our whole calendar system is based on, on this roughly uh, than we have today. So, you know, we, we add this up and we, we get uh, give or take 6,000 years. So th now notice I have some variability in here, like uh, plus or minus 50 at this point, plus or minus 25. I like to go with plus or minus 200 for the whole thing. Is that a big deal? If the earth is 6,200 years old versus 5,800 years old? No, not, not a big deal at all. Not when you compare it to the accepted age of, of billions, right? 13.77 billion years old. And when I talk to other Christians about this, like, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. However, the days in Genesis aren't really regular days. I've been through this so many times. Um, I want to... There's lots of quotes like this from Hebrew scholars, right? I want to point out this one uh, from uh, Mr. Barr. He says, probably, so far as I know, there is no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university. Notice the qualifications he's putting in there, right? Hebrew scholar, the Old Testament, world-class universities, credentialed people, who does not believe that the writers of Genesis 1 through 11 intended to convey their... The, the reader's idea is that the figures contained in Genesis genealogies provided by simple edition, like, like our box of simple edition, a chronology from the beginning of the world up to the latter stages of biblical story. There's other quotes from these, these world-renowned scholars that say the same thing. Yeah, it really looks like the writer of Genesis 1 is trying to tell us that these were six ordinary days, and it just over and over and over again. Uh, why? would we try to go through so much effort to make them look like they were otherwise with day-age theory, gap theory, and framework hypothesis, and who knows what else is around the corner? Why would we try to feed, you know, insert so much time uh, into the biblical account of creation? And I asked someone this recently, and their aunt, well, they gave an honest answer. They said, well, it's because scientists say that the earth is four and a half billion years old. So I understand the genealogies, I understand you're adding them up, but we don't know what happened in, in creation week. We don't? There was evening and morning, day one, evening and morning, day two, evening and morning, day three. I, I think we know exactly the, the time scale we're talking about. But really what it comes down to is when you press deeper in a conversation, the Christians really don't want to feel embarrassed because the whole world has accepted this idea of an old universe, of an old earth. And if we come say, oh no, it's 6,000 years, give or take 200, we look uninformed, don't we? But I've just shown you that these methods of deriving or calculating the age of the universe has starting assumptions. And your starting assumptions is going to differ whether you include the Bible or whether you exclude the Bible. I would suggest you include the Bible because the Creator was there. He knows exactly when He did it. He knows exactly how He did it. And by the way, you're not going to, you're not going to get much agreement from secular scientists by saying, well, I, I agree that the universe is old. Um, look at the order of events in Genesis. It's, it's so opposite of the Big Bang. You cannot reconcile the two. Uh, so you just have to end up discounting the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And we talked about that before. We're not going to get back into that uh, today. But it's not just Genesis. And we've touched on this before, too. I think it was in our second lesson. If we, if we look at Exodus 20.11, this is kind of right in the middle of the Ten Commandments, which got a little image of the Ten Commandments there. And notice where, where the star is. Well, what, what's where that star? It's right after uh, the Fourth Commandment. This is what he says. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. You can discount Genesis 1 through 11 all you want and say God didn't really mean for us to take that literally. It's allegory. It's illusory. Whatever you want to say, you can discount that. But what do you do with Exodus 20:11? God wrote, Scripture says, with his own hand, his own finger, the Ten Commandments, written in stone, and right in the middle of them, he's telling them to keep the Sabbath, right? Six days you have to work, rest on the seventh. Why? Because that's what I did. That's what God did. He created in six days, he rested on the seventh. This is where we get our seven-day work week. There's no other basis for it. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the moon or the sun or the constellations. This is it. This is the only reference we have as to why we have a seven-day week. 
It's not that God created for billions of years and then rested for billions of years. No, He created in six days and He rested on one. Why is that so hard to understand? And it's not just Exodus. This is compounded as you go throughout Scripture. Remember, there are hundreds of passages that we uh, alluded to early on that is based on the history in Genesis. The writers thought that was literal, that that was really the way we're supposed to interpret it. So be careful, right? It's a slippery slope. Well, why is this even important to begin? Who cares, right? I, I, I gave this lesson about a week ago, and I kind of started out with, anybody know the age of the universe? Uh, anybody care the age of the universe? And, and nobody really cared. And I, I just want to say for the record, I could care less how old the universe is. If God did it in 14, 15, 16, 20 billion years versus 6,000, I don't care. But what I do care is that anything that sets itself up against something that God has taught us so plainly, I care about that. Um, there's many things. It's not just the age of the universe. What, what about the um, marriage between a man and a woman? We hear one thing from society, right? We get a whole different idea from Scripture. Well, one has set itself up against the other. I'm going to go with Scripture on that one. Or what about the idea that Jesus wasn't divine? He was just a man, right? He's a good man. He did good things. He taught good things, but he wasn't divine. That's against what I read in Scripture. Or how about the one where this life is it? When you're dead, you're dead. There's nothing else. Well, not according to Scripture, that there is another life. Um, and it's very important what we do here as to which life we're going to be a part of, right? So this is why it's as important uh, ultimately why it's important. And we'll start, we'll look at something Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians 10, 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. So first of all, Paul is saying, we're in, we're in a war, right? There's a war going on, and we have weapons, but, but they're not physical weapons. Well, do tell, Paul, what, what are you talking about? Uh, I've got these weapons available at my dis disposal for this war that I'm, I'm supposedly in. Well, he goes on in verse 5. We are destroying, what's that? Arguments and arrogance raised against the knowledge of God. And we are taking captive, every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. There are concepts and ideas we hear from society which directly go against what we read in Scripture very plainly. And Paul says... We're equipped to battle this, right? This is not a, a fleshly battle, but we're equipped to destroy these arguments, right? Knock them down because some of these are very dangerous ideas. In fact, there's been many, many books written about Darwin's dangerous idea. Why, why is this idea of evolution and natural selection dangerous? Um, and there are many, many reasons for that. But Paul says, this is the war we're fighting. This is the reason why it's important ultimately. What is the enemy? Well, it's time. Time is the enemy. And I'll read you a quote here from uh, George Wald. He says, Time is in fact the hero of the plot. What we regard as impossible, as the impossible on the basis of human experience, is meaningless here. Given so much time, emphasis mine, obviously, given so much time, the impossible becomes possible, the possible probable, and the probable virtually certain. One only has to wait, time itself performs the miracles. Now we're talking about the beginning of things. When did the universe come into existence? How long ago was that? And even though this is a relatively old quote, this has not changed. Up till right up to today, it's the same thing. Time, just give enough time. Whether you're talking about biological evolution, or whether you're talking about the, the, the Earth's evolution, or the cosmos evolution, right? We're talking about three different types of evolution. It doesn't matter. Give all of them time, and what may seem impossible to us is possible. Time is the hero. Where's God in this statement? There is no God. In fact, there is no God required on this view. Is that an idea that sets itself up against the knowledge of God? This is directly opposing God. God said, I did it. It all started with me. I'm outside of space and time. I brought it all into existence. And here was saying, no, nah, just give things time. It'll happen. Even no matter how ridiculous it sounds, based on our, our human experiences, this is what he's saying. Just give it time. It'll happen. Okay, well, let's see what Jesus thought about, about time. 
And to do that, we'll go to Mark uh, 10.6. Here, Jesus is speaking, and he says, But from the beginning of creation, God created them male and female. Now, it's very dangerous to take one verse out and, and kind of talk about the one verse. There's a whole context around this verse, but um, particularly they're asking him about divorce. Is it lawful to be divorced? And he says, well, you know, yeah, Moses allowed you to be divorced because your hearts were hard. He says, but from the beginning of what? Creation. God created who? Humans, male and female. Because he goes on to say, this is why, you know, um, uh, you leave your father and mother and, and you get married. This is clearly talking about human beings and when you put it all in context. But Jesus is saying, from the beginning of creation, God created them. So really, we have a battle of two timelines. The one timeline is what we see in Scripture. That's super easy, right, to understand. Um, <clears throat> there's my roughly 6,000 years. Uh, here's the be beginning where we have the creation of people. Um, Six-day creation event. Jesus, roughly, AD 30, when he said those words in Mark, like from the beginning of creation, he created them male and female. And here we are today. Very easy to understand. Well, what's the other timeline look like? And, and why should I really be opposed to it? Well, here we have the secular timeline, the one that doesn't include God, right? The one where time is the hero and the creator of everything. Roughly 14 billion years. Notice the difference of where people are in the timeline. At the beginning of creation, day six, as a matter of fact, is where people were on this timeline. This timeline there are billions of years before we even have Earth. And then there are billions of years before there are people. If Jesus was here and He said, from the beginning of creation, God created them male and female, beginning of what? What sense would that make? Uh, the beginning, there was, there was nobody. There's no people for billions of years in this secondary timeline. But Jesus says, no, from the beginning of creation, God created male and female. What, that makes sense to me. It doesn't make sense for Christians to try to say, well, the, the earth really is really old, the universe is really old, and uh, Jesus didn't know what he was talking about. I don't think that's the case whatsoever because it was Jesus who brought everything into existence. Of course he knows. It's not complicated, is it? The other thing I want to point out here, which is very important, is, is where death is. In Scripture, Shortly after the creation of these human beings, from the beginning, where God created them male and female, um, they messed up. And God told them in Genesis 2, around verse 16, hey, you can eat any tree you want, but He gave them one tree they were not to eat of, and He says, in the day you eat of this tree, you will certainly die. Right? In the Hebrew, it's, it's death listed twice, die, die, which means you're going to start dying, you're going to continue dying until you're dead. That's exactly what happened to Adam as a result of his disobedience. So death entered only after everything was created. It wasn't a part of his original creation. It was a punishment. On this timeline, notice where death is. So here we have people, then death. Here we have death, then people. Because evolution requires dead ends of living things, starting with those so-called simple single-celled organisms that started it all three billion years ago, and, and one branch lived uh, while others you know, mutated themselves out of existence. And I'll never forget asking a young man this, this one time. This was before I really got into this type of apologetics. And, he just hit me with evolution, 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 and I was wanting to talk about gospel, gospel, gospel. Now, don't, don't discount the power in the gospel. I don't know what happened to that young man after the conversation. I still believe there's power in the gospel. That, that's where the power is. But I finally caved in and said, yeah, yeah, whatever. God could have used evolution to bring about life. He goes, what? He says, your God, who you're trying to tell me loves me so much that He gave His Son to die for me that He used the most cruelest method of bringing about life possible. He says, that doesn't make sense to me. And that was about 22 years ago, and that has stuck with me to this day. And you know, he's absolutely right. The timelines are, are so different. Well, does this really make a difference? Well, let's go back to Scripture and see. 
In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, For since by a man came, uh, death came, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. Okay, Paul. So Paul seems to be saying that one man brought death and, and one man brought life. Well, don't keep us waiting, Paul. Who are we talking about here? He says, For as in Adam, we're going all the way back, the first human being, all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. So we have this idea that death, just like, again, even if you discount Genesis and say you can't really believe it, do you believe 1 Corinthians? Where there was no death, Adam brought the death when he disobeyed God. And that's why Christ had to come. What does that really do for the gospel? And this is, this is the point. If you don't remember anything else about this lesson, this is the most important thing. Again, I could care less about how old the universe is or the earth is. I don't believe they're that old. But what does that idea do to the concept of the gospel? Because that's important to me. It should be important to you as well. So I'm going to put up the timeline again here, the secular timeline, not, not the biblical one. And just keep in mind, death, disease, struggle, famine, Cancer. We, we look at the fossil record. We, we find dinosaurs with, with cancer. We find fish with cancer. We find evidence of animals eating one another. Just horrible, horrible looking at the fossil record. Before Adam would have ever come on the scene and sinned. Now, can you imagine Adam in the garden and God says, if you eat of this particular tree, you're going to die. And this, this is me. This is, this is my interpretation of Adam looking around. Uh, okay, God, well, it looks like death is already a part of your good creation. looks like things have been dying long since before I came on the scene. What, well, who cares? What's the big deal? Well, here's the big deal. We're picking up in 1 Corinthians 15. We, we left off in verse 22. We pick up in verse 23. But each in his own order, talking about you know, Christ resurrecting from the dead, Christ the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ, that is coming. Then comes the end, so we're talking about the end of everything, the end of all time, when He hands over the kingdom to our God and Father, when He has abolished all rule and authority and power, for He must reign until He has put all His enemies under His feet. Guess what one of those enemies is? It's in the same verse. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. Paul is saying death is the enemy. Can you imagine God using death as a way to bring about life all the way up to human beings? It's the enemy, and it's the last thing that's going to be destroyed. That secular view of the timeline makes no sense to me. And when we have this type of view, whether you realize it or not, you're undermining the power of the gospel. Well, how am I doing that, Kim? I don't want to do that. Well, did Christ die a physical death or a spiritual death? Well, Definitely physical. It talks about the nails being driven. He had a physical body. It was a physical experience. Well, why did he have to die physically? If you go all the way back to the garden, God told Adam, the day you eat of this fruit, you will die. Some Christians want to say, well, God meant a spiritual death. Okay. I'm not saying he wasn't spiritually separated from God after his sin, but if it was primarily and only spiritual, why did Christ have to physically die? That makes no sense at all. Christ came to save us from physical death and from that death having a permanent separation from God. That's the only thing that makes sense to me. So this timeline is not only wrong biblically, but it doesn't give you the, the, the power of the gospel anymore. It takes the power right out of the gospel because now you have death, which Paul said clearly is the enemy, which is the champion in evolution. Death is the champion all the way up to, to humans. Again, that's the most important thing, the concept I want to cover. But also, this is a difficult question. Again, the age of things. Uh, how do you know how old something is? Um, it's very difficult. And look, just look at the history of, of how old the universe has been since 1929. Uh, and I start at 1929 because this is where real science comes into the picture, right? This is where redshift was discovered and, oh, now, now we know uh, the size of things, and we can rewind that clock and get a good age. Well, 1929, that definite age was 3 billion years old. And then, every so often, it climb up, climb up, climb up. 1975, now it's between 15 and 20 billion years old. 
So what, what's that? Not even 50 years later, from 3 billion to almost 20 billion, and then it was bumped down, 1998, we get up to 2013, this is the number that people generally say, 13.77, 13.8 if you want to round up, or, or round up even more, 14 billion. Um, this was measured by measuring the cosmic microwave background radiation and taking those assumptions, plugging them in the math box, and coming out with 13.7. But notice it didn't stay there. Just a few years later, National Science Foundation, using other um, measurements, said no, it's 12.7. Then from this big range here, this is, this is kind of funny, um, from the year 2000 to 2021, so in 2000, Scientists discovered what they think it was the oldest planet in the universe. And they, they nicknamed this planet the Methuselah planet. Um, not meth planet, as I have here. I apologize for that. I just, just noticed that. But that's, that's short for Methuselah, okay? Um, where did they get that? Well, obviously from Scripture, you know, the oldest recorded uh, living human being. And so this planet, they said, is 16 billion years old. Oh, Houston, we have a problem. If the Earth is or the universe is 13.7, how can we have a planet in the universe that's 16 billion years old? That's like me being older than my father. Uh, it's, that's a logical impossibility. So for 21 years, they worked on this problem. They worked on this age problem. They whittled it down, and whittled it down, whittled it down, whittled it down, until finally, ah, here's some breathing room. It's 12 billion years old. Really? I mean, if, if, if we had an exact scientific way to measure how old things are, why does it change frequently? This one had to change, obviously. You can't have a planet inside of a universe that's older than the universe itself. But then in 2019, and this is still a problem that hasn't been worked out, using nearby galaxies and looking at the, the, the redshift and measuring that, we've come out with another age of the universe, yet another one, 11.4. Well, now we're back to the Methuselah problem. Even if it's 12 billion years old, it's older than the universe itself again. Um, so I, I put this up here to see, not to make fun of science in any kind of way. Uh, I love science. Uh, I consider myself a, a man of science. Um, but it's to show you that some things are based on assumptions and then put into solid math, turn the crank, and, and out comes a different answer. Be careful here, right? We hold firmly to scripture, we hold loosely to theories, because obviously theories change all the time. That's why they're theories, okay? Uh, just be, be aware of that. Well, that's not the, the only problem. There, there are other problems with this, this age of the universe. And one has to do with the, the idea of the Big Bang, which coincidentally starts with nothing, when I say nothing, I mean nothing. No, no quantum vacuum. Nothing that's measured. There's literally no thing. The universe came out of no thing. Cosmologists hate this. They hate this. They hate this. They hate this. Nobody likes this idea, but there isn't anything better. Well, I, I think I have something better. If you're going to bring something this massive into existence, wouldn't you have to have something that existed here to do it? That's where God comes in. Oh, Cam, you're just using God of the gaps theories. Oh, well, no, it makes sense. If you're going to bring space and matter into time, whatever brings that in has to be outside of it. That's, that's good logic. But if we, if we think about this idea of the Big Bang, and by the way, this represents that expansion I was talking about, the, the expansion of the universe. So right after the Big Bang, this incredible heat, then we have nothing, and then we have the formation of the first stars, as, as the theory goes. I don't believe this theory. It's totally opposite of what we have in Genesis 1, right? Or day one, what do we have? We have the earth. Or the earth's way out here in the Big Bang Theory, right? Um, but, but, but anyway, what I'm trying to get at is if we look further back in time, and well, how do you look further back in time? You have a crystal ball? Um, no, we try to find light that's the farthest light that we can detect. Again, going back to the James Webb Telescope, it's, it's that there in space. It's outside of our atmosphere, so that eliminates some of the fuzziness there. And it's able to see very clearly and detect very faint amounts of extremely red-shifted light. So, as the story goes, that light is coming further and further away, so it must be older. Whatever object that is must be older. And here's what it expected to find. It expected to look back in time to see very, very old light 
from just when the first stars were forming. That's how sensitive, it's, it's really a, a magnificent feat of science, a telescope. You should kind of look at the engineering marvel, and, and it, is, it is impressive. But it's so sensitive, it can see extremely faint redshifted light, supposedly from when stars first started to form. Um, you know, and somewhere in here we have first galaxies started to form. And really they got excited to see, hey, we're going to see old, old light that's, that's reaching us that's so faint and see these images of galaxies coming together. In other words, they're disorganized. They're not galaxies yet. Um, well, Houston, again, we, we have a problem. This was not detected by the James Webb. We'll get more of that in a moment. Um, this, if you don't recognize it, is the Hercules Corona uh, Borealis Great Wall. That's another mouthful. This is a structure that is so huge in space, it goes totally against Big Bang expectations. Because remember, in early universe, we see small structures and they're just starting, or we think this is how, right? We, the small structures came together first. And if we look out, Einstein said, you know, there's something called this cosmological principle where um, it should be relatively uniform throughout the whole universe. No matter where you're looking up to a certain size, it should look the same. It's all the same. Earth is in no special spot. Not according to Genesis 1, we're in a very special spot. But according to Big Bang, there are no, there are no special spots. And so when this was discovered, this is a massive clumping together of galaxies from only a few billion years after the Big Bang, supposedly. This should not be here. This is too big, and it's too organized, and there's too many galaxies. How big are we talking about? From end to end, it's 10 billion light years across. What's a light year? Uh, well, it's the distance light travels in a year. About, well, if you take 186,000 miles per second and you calculate how, long, how far it can go in a year, uh, that's what, about 6 trillion miles? So one light year, about 6 trillion miles. This is 10 billion light years across. This is huge. In fact, it takes up 10% of the visible viewing spectrum we have of our entire universe. 10% way early on in the universe's history, supposedly. And this is not the only large structure that, that scientists have found. There's, there's several others. This just happens to be the largest. And it's so big, it just throws a whole wrinkle into Big Bang expectations. And as I said, uh, well, it was discovered in 2013, right? And we can, we can see kind of where it gets its name from two different constellations. This thing is massive. 10 billion light years across, as I mentioned, 10% of the diameter of the observable universe. Well, what does that mean, the observable universe? Um, this is absolutely mind boggling. Remember we talked about Voyager and how it just, it's still on that point that we showed in the picture and it would take 30,000 years before it got out of our own solar system. And there are maybe 400 billion other solar systems in our galaxy. It's huge, just our, our galaxy. Well, this, this is so big, it, it boggles the mind. So we have a light travel problem. When we look at the visible universe, which is supposedly expanding, and at the edges it's expanding incredibly fast, and, and in fact it's expanding so fast at the edges, the light coming from those galaxies will never get here. We'll never see it. So some are saying that the galaxy now is not 93 billion light years across, but more like two trillion light years across. But we can't see it because the light will never get here. It's so far away. How massive is that? And I'm not saying that's the correct view, that's the right view. I'm not even saying that the universe is expanding. It appears to be. We, the scientists could be wrong about that. Um, but this is just too big to have formed that early in the universe's history. It blows all uh, expectations out of the water. Well, this is an important quote. I hope it sticks with you because this is from a cosmologist. He says, cosmology may look like a science, but it isn't a science. Oh wait, do tell. A basic tenet of science is that you can do repeatable experiments and you can't do that in cosmology. Isn't that interesting? Now I have great respect for cosmologists. 
Um, now, cosmology is different than astronomy and what astrophysicists do, where they, they measure things the best they can, redshift being one. Cosmology takes from that discipline and they extrapolate it into things like the Big Bang, okay? Things that you can't bring into the lab, you can't repeat, you, you can't... Uh, it's, it's a one-time thing that happened in the past, and so it's, it's largely speculation. And here's a guy that's saying, just, just remember that. We need to be very careful about this, this uh, field of cosmology. I'm not saying it's not a science. I wouldn't go that far. Um, it, it is a, a field of science, but it's not like building rockets. It's not like designing drugs to go into the human body to, to combat disease. It's not that kind of science. It's a lot different than that kind of science. Okay, well, why is this such a difficult question? I'll, I'll give you a very simple analogy. Okay, you see a candle, you walk into a room, you see a candle burning. How long has it been burning? Can you know for sure, scientifically, how long it's been burning? And I do this thought experiment all the time with people, and, and, it's, and it's fun, right? Because different people say, oh, well, um, uh, we can measure the wax at the bottom. And then we can rewind the clock. We can measure the rate of burn and the rate of drip and think, oh, well, if we rewind that, then we'll know how long it's been burning. But then when you get into the very specifics, like, well, how do we know no wax has been added or removed from the base? How do we know the rate of the burn has always been the same? Could there have been more oxygen in the room in the past and less at, at times and more, I mean, to, to vary the, the, the rate of the burn? Um, how tall was the candle? How, how big is the wick? There's lots of things that we just don't know. Again, assumptions that we put into our very solid math and we get very different answers. This is why trying to figure out the age of something is very hard. In fact, the best way to know how old something is is to go to someone who was there when that particular thing came into existence. If you want to know how old I am, you go ask, well, you could have asked my parents when they were alive, well, how old is he? Well, they should know they were there and they'll tell you. Despite what my driver's license might say, my birth certificate, a reliable eyewitness will know and they'll tell you. That's the best way. We don't always have this, do we? But do we have this with our universe? Do we have a reliable eyewitness who was there? We do. If God is anything, He's reliable. And He says, this is how I did it. Here's the order of events I did it. Here's how long it took me. I hate to say how long it took me because I believe He could have done it in an instant. This is how long He took. He took six days. And He did that, I think, as an example for us as to how we should pattern our work weeks. Hey, we don't need to work 24-7, seven, seven days a week. We need to take breaks. We need, need to rest. Okay, so I'm going to wrap this up with, with how I view these things because we've looked at evidences for an old universe. We've looked at evidences for a young universe. Uh, we looked at why I think it's important, you know, the, the gospel connection there. Well, how are we supposed to look at this then? Because nobody wants to look like they're not educated when they're talking to somebody that's, that's highly educated, right? And this is the fear that I, I come across, even with Christian scientists, when I talk to geologists or, or, or even cosmologists or astrophysicists, and, and they just don't want to look, they don't want to be embarrassed among their peers and say, yeah, I believe the earth is young. Although there are many Christian men and women scientists who do believe the earth is young. So don't get the idea that all scientists think this way. That's just not true. But I, I think the universe is mature. Well, what do you mean? Okay, we'll read some scripture, we'll go through some thought experiments, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of show you what, what I have in mind. Then God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit according to their kind, with seed in them. And it was so. Okay, that's Genesis 1. Now, let's put on our, our thought hats here just for a moment. So, what day did God create the plants and the trees? That would include the fruit trees, by the way. That would be day three, okay, day three, according to what we read in Genesis 1. Adam was created on day six. Well, what did he eat? Now, don't tell me that Adam ate fruit and vegetables because those things take time to grow. I mean, wheat grows pretty fast, but it doesn't grow in three days. Fruit trees take three years to six years to mature before they start yielding fruit. Did Adam have to wait six years before he could eat fruit? Did he have to wait months and months before vegetation actually produced fruit or uh, vegetation or vegetables? No, of course not. 
Well, let me ask you this. Did God act supernaturally when it came to creating mature fruit trees, mature plants and vegetables for Adam? He must have. If those were created on day three and Adam was on day six, he must have been able to eat those right away, not have to wait years or months even. Uh, that wouldn't have worked. So God must have acted supernaturally to mature these parts of creation just for Adam. Okay, let's look at another example, 127. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Lovely uh, poetic phrase here, the way, the way it is. Okay, again, put on our, our thinking caps. What did Adam look like? Did he look like a, a newborn baby? Did he look like a toddler, uh, a teenager, or an adult, or, or an elderly, elderly man? What did he look like? Well, I think everyone would agree, based on the hints we have in Scripture, one being God spoke to him. God gave him a language. Adam communicated with God. That's, that's not a baby, um, even a toddler. Uh, Adam was able to reproduce. Definitely not a baby or a toddler. May, okay, now we're maybe in the teenager years or, or young adult years. Uh, Adam was to rule over the animals. He had a job to do. He had a task. He could understand how to do these tasks. So um, I would say that he was probably an older teenager or, or a young adult, right? Young 20s. Do I know that for sure? No. But did God do something supernaturally here when he created Adam as a mature adult? Well, he must have. He must have, or Adam wouldn't have been able to be ready to do these things immediately. Something supernatural. What about 114? Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And they shall serve as signs and for seasons and for days and for years. What is the purpose of these lights? Well, one to give light and the other so you can keep track of things. A countering system. Uh, constellations, great for keeping track of the calendar. The moon, right? Oh, oh, and he made the stars also. I, I, I love how God just threw this in through inspiration when Moses is writing this down. Remember the vastness of the universe we've been talking about. How big even our own solar system is. 30,000 years at this Voyager traveling at a million miles a day. It'll take that long to get out of our solar system. By the way, it'll run out of fuel in about 2033, 2036. It'll never make it out of our solar system. It won't even make it out. But it's a big place. The universe is, is huge. Oh yeah, he made those. Wouldn't you love a little more detail here? But this is, this is the power of our God. Again, putting on our thinking caps, how did the lights from those faraway objects, and by the way, most of the stars that we see at night, if we go to a really dark place in the world and look up and we see the vast, uncountable number of stars, most of those are right in our, in our own galaxy. They're not outside of our galaxy. Most of them are, are right here. Um, but they're light years away, meaning they would have taken years for their light traveling at today's you know, observable rates to get here. Uh, well, how could they reach Earth without taking billions of years? You think God did something supernaturally there? Because they were for Adam right away. So these were created day four. Adam was day six. Adam could have looked up and seen the splendor of God and started using uh, even the constellations right, right away to start keeping track of countering and things. Um, God must have acted supernaturally there. Uh, what about uh, Genesis 1.9? Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Now we're, we're, we're back to day three. We're kind of moving around a little bit, right? So day three, he separated the waters from the land. And notice he used the word dry. It was, it was dry. It was ready, right? Um, the earth wasn't, well, I'm getting ahead of myself because I got a question on it in just a moment. Well, actually, it's, it's now, so I'm not too far ahead of myself. Uh, question, how long did it take the earth to cool from a molten state before dry land was ready for life? And I'll give you a second to think about that. I hope you understood that's a trick question. The earth was never in a molten state. From Genesis 1.1, we have the earth, and what do we have? We have water. We don't have a molten, heated state on the earth. We have an earth that's cool. It, it already it has water on it right there from the very beginning. And by day three, it was ready not only to separate the water from the land, but day three was also when he caused the vegetation to, to, to sprout up. Did God do something supernaturally here? Because normally it takes rocks a long time to form. 
especially we're talking about the those basement rocks like like granite and those sorts of things now other, other rocks form very quickly like volcanic rock i've actually watched volcanic flows stood 10 feet feet from them and just watched them cool and develop a crust over them um, but that doesn't happen with with granite we don't think uh, marble and those things like that those take a long time so did god act supernaturally to bring these rocks to a state that they would be ready to support soil by day three? He must have. Yes, there is a point to where I'm going here. Just bear with me. So just as, we just looked at these four quick examples, and it looks like every example, God had to do something supernatural. Well, this is a duh moment, right? Because there was nothing, then there was something. Only God could bring something from nothing to begin with. We're talking supernatural event. But specifically, during Creation Week, supernatural, 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 supernatural. Here's the clincher. No modern dating method is going to be accurate that doesn't take this into account. It's just not going to happen. We can date a rock radiometrically. We can look at the radioactive isotopes. We can look at the isochrons and plot them out on a map. And we can do all these very scientifically sound you know, mathematical box experiments, but if we don't take into consideration that God supernaturally brought them into existence, we're going to get the wrong date on the other side. Now, when it comes to dating rocks, uh, that's a whole other lesson. We get wrong. We get dates that are widely uh, variable anyway. But, but even if they were all the same, we used four different methods on the same rock and we got the same exact result every time, if we don't take into account that God supernaturally brought those rocks into existence, we're going to be wrong. And by the way, for rocks that we have observed coming into existence, like Mount St. Helens blew its dome off in 1980. Uh, Ten years later, they used very sound scientific radiometric dating to date the new dome that had fully hardened. They got dates widely ranging from hundreds of millions to 1.1, 1.2 billion years old. The rock was 10 years old. If we can't get the dates right for the rock we know the age of, how do we, can we trust the ages that we don't know? But regardless of that, even if it was scientifically sound and accurate, everything gave the same date regardless. If we don't take this into consideration, we're going to get the wrong age. Now, to drive this home a little further, I got an illustration. Maybe this will make it easier. You're from another universe. I know my wife thinks I'm from another universe a lot. Uh, we just, just say you're from another universe. I, I don't believe there are other universes. There's no evidence of that. We don't get that idea from Scripture either. But let's say there's another universe and you travel from there to Earth on day seven. So creation, the six days of creation just happened. And on day seven, you're in the garden with Adam. Okay. How old would you say Adam and Eve were? Now, looking at them and looking at their ability to, to take care of the garden, they, they communicate uh, and do the work that God had them to do. And, well, maybe you would say 20s. I don't know, early 20s, uh, you would be wrong. They were one day old, both of them, one day old. By the way, you can think about this after the lesson. Did, did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? Okay, chew on that for a minute. Um, what else? What about rocks? You've seen the rocks laying around, right? Uh, whatever kind of rock it is, how old would you say the rocks were? Would you say they were billions? Because, hey, it takes a long time for... For rocks to uh, go through the decay process and produce other elements and well you would be wrong they were just a few days old from from day one when we had the earth to today at most they were six days old some of the rocks you would be wrong they're not going to be billions uh, what about the light from the galaxies looking up the nighttime sky which must have been splendid for adam to see without any light pollution Right, just to see everything as 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 God had uh, put it there originally must have been beautiful. Well, you might say, well, as from another universe, you're going to be more you're going to be more intelligent. You're going to know how these things work, right? Well, we know light travels at a certain speed. You would say, well, these galaxies are billions of years old. You would have been wrong. They were created three days ago, on day three. You see how using your modern know-how, your modern intellect, no matter how scientific it is, trying to date things that God supernaturally brought into existence during Creation Week, you're going to be wrong every time. Now, I want to show you an example of, of what I mean here. I think the, I have a video that follows this that may be um, 
make, make sure I can give you some perspective. But going back to the vegetation, remember Adam on day six, I believe fully he was able to eat plants and vegetables and fruits. I mean, what else was he going to do? He couldn't eat the animals. Meat wasn't sanctioned until after the flood. It was, he says, I give every green grass to you and to the animals. That's what everybody ate back then. They were all vegetarians. And he says, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, fruits on the earth bearing fruit according to their kind and seed within them. And it was so. And I want to focus on this, this wording here, sprout vegetation. And the King James says to bring forth. Now, what, we have different words in the Hebrew. I'm, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, right? But I am able to look up a word and kind of get the general idea. But when God uses different words, they, they have different meanings. Let there be light is a different word than bring forth vegetation. They're very closely related in, in terms of creation and creating something. Um, but if we think about this idea of to sprout, to bring forth, imagine... Day three, you're from that other universe. You're there, you're observing, and you hear God. The Supreme Creator say, let the earth bring forth, sprout vegetation. This is the process I imagine taking place at this point. Where he didn't just say boom and things appeared fully, fully grown, that they went through a maturity process. In fact, this is me, this is Kim speaking, that if you were to travel there on that day and you were to look at trees fruit trees with this beautiful fruit on them cut one open you would see tree rings i think god brought them into existence in a mature state not fooling anyone there not trying to with the light coming from distant get we'll talk about that in a moment i don't think he's trying to fool anyone i think he brought everything into existence in a mature fashion Does that make sense all right back to the light because it always comes back to the light it always comes back to stars and distant galaxies and how massively far away they are, and yet their light is here. It takes, I mean, light travels fast, but some of these galaxies we see are billions of light years away. In other words, it takes light, as fast as it is, billions of years before it could get to our, our, our medium-sized galaxy, right? Our Goldilocks galaxy, if you will. So let's go back to this idea. Now, remember... Early on, we, we kept talking about this idea of stretching. We started out with that word, in, uh, the, the verse in Job, that God stretches out the heavens. Well, what is he talking about there? And I'm not saying this is exactly what God was trying to tell us. I'm not saying that at all, but here's what scientists believe. We have all these galaxies, and notice these, these cross lines here. Consider these lines the fabric of space. Okay, so the galaxies seem to be sitting in something, now, this is a two-dimensional drawing of it. If you, if you, if you see three-dimensional drawings, it's like a picture of box springs and having planets inside there because this fabric is all around, right? What is this fabric? Nobody knows. What's it made of? Nobody knows. But it's believed that there's a fabric of space that things are literally in. And if the universe is expanding, and these guys say this is Milky Way, and these galaxies all seem to be going away from us based, based on redshift. Again, we, we could have a weird interpretation or a wrong interpretation of redshift, but let's just say it's right. Um, there is some debate among scientists on that, but let's say we're, these galaxies are speeding away from us. Well, how fast are they speeding away? Well, near us, they're speeding away at a rate of about 45,000 miles per second. It's pretty fast. However, the further out we get, the faster they're speeding away from us. The longer their light is stretched out into the red spectrum. If you think about stretching something like that bubble gum and you're moving pretty fast, that makes sense that the outer edges are moving faster than the inner part of the gum, right? So this is, I keep going back to gum. I haven't chewed gum in uh, years, but... Um, that's the best analogy I can think of at the moment. So a little video here to show that as, as the fabric is being stretched out, not that these galaxies are moving away from us that fast, but they're sitting in the fabric and the fabric is moving away that fast. And the further out we go, the faster it gets. So 45,000 miles per second, relatively close to us. Uh, we go out what they call a megaparsec. Um, you know, these numbers are so big, they had to invent new language, like astronomical units and megaparsecs and... Um, because you can only write 10 to the, you know, 
so much power so many times, it's just easy to start over and say one. <laughs> one astronomical unit, one megaparsec. Um, but way, way out here, the fabric is moving faster than the speed of light. Now, nothing in the universe, matter, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. But this fabric, whatever this fabric is, it's free to travel as fast as it wants. Now, if the interpretation is right and things are getting further and further apart, out here on the edges is things that are moving away faster than the speed of light. That means the light they admit back towards Earth will never get here because it just it's expanded out so far. Um, and that's why some scientists are now starting to say, well, yeah, there's a visible universe, 93 billion light years across, and then there's the stuff we can't see that the light will never even get here. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. I'd believe either way, according to Scripture, because God is massive enough to do that. So what is the stuff that's being stretched, and how is it being stretched? Well, it's being stretched by, by dark energy. We all, we all know that. Or you know what dark energy is. You go home, open the cupboard, just get yourself a cup of dark energy. Nobody knows what dark energy is. But they believe it must exist because of the, the expansion, right? And it must be super powerful to move these massive galaxies at such tremendous speeds. 17 times in the Old Testament, God gives us this, this imagery, this idea that He stretches out the heavens. Could God be trying to tell us something? I, now, this is Kim speaking, right? I'm not saying all 17 verses have to do with the expansion of the universe. I'm not saying that correlation is necessarily there. But like, like the one in Isaiah, it says, It is He who sits above the circle of the earth. It's interesting, back in Isaiah's day, they already knew the earth was round, right? It is He who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Oh, aren't we? Compared to the size of just our own solar system, our own Milky Way, we are so small. Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to live in. And we have this idea 17 different times in the Old Testament. And uh, this, is, this is the way my, my simple mind works. We have this unbelievably large uh, universe. Nobody knows exactly how big it is. But again, going back to the Voyager, 30,000 years just to get outside of our own uh, sun's influence. It's massive. Trillions of galaxies, potentially. Only God would have the power to do this. To, to, to make this happen on such a grand scale. Why would God tell us this over and over and over again if He hadn't provided some kind of evidence that He's doing it? Um, <clears throat> now, would I be fine if scientists came back and, and said, ah, oh, we've misinterpreted redshift. Things really aren't speeding away from us like we thought. Uh, it, it's, it's something else. Yeah, I would be, I would be okay with that. Uh, I'm just saying that we have these clues in here that just might... Uh, whatever you think on the subject, this is telling us how amazingly powerful our God is. The, the universe is nothing. The heavens are nothing to Him. He can, spread, he can step right into Him like you're stepping into a tent. He's that powerful. And I think that's, that's the bottom line we need to get out of that. And then Colossians 1, 15 and 17, we'll kind of wrap it up here. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by Him all things were created, both in the heavens... And on the earth, visible, invisible, were the thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities. And some people ask me, well, you know, yeah, Kim, you talk about dark matter and dark energy. We didn't talk about dark matter, but that's another invisible thing that nobody can see, you can't detect, and uh, you can't measure it, you can't put it in the lab, but yet they believe it's there because the universe seems to be missing a lot of matter. There should be more matter, but there's not. According to Big Bang ideology, there should be more matter. According to creation, why would I expect more matter? God created it exactly the way it is, and that's, that's uh, the way it should be. But whether you believe in those things, and so what if scientists discover dark matter and dark energy one day? What's that do to, to your, your biblical way of looking at things? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Why? Look in this verse. All things were created through Him. Talking about Jesus. He's the firstborn, right? Heavens on the earth, visible, invisible, if there is such a thing as dark matter and dark energy, and it's, it's somehow you know, found out to be uh, uh, true, that's great. I know who created it. I know who put it there. Uh, and he goes on. All things have been created through Him 
and for him, and this is key, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. There are things in physics which boggle the mind, how, how things can stay together when we think they should be repelled apart, but yet there they are. But going back to the, the section there, he is before all things. You can believe in the Big Bang. Now, if you're a Christian, you can try to reconcile that with Scripture if you want. That's it's totally up to you. I don't think God's going to say on Judgment Day, because you believe in the Big Bang, you're not welcome here. I don't think that's the way it's going to go down at all. Um, but we need to be careful about what we think and, and what we hold firmly to. But the only thing that makes sense is not the Big Bang, that something came out of nothing. What makes sense is there was something before there was matter and energy. And that something is Jesus. And He's the only one, God's the only one with enough power to bring it all into existence out of absolutely nothing at all. That makes sense. Now, Big Bang from nothing makes zero sense to me. It makes less than zero sense to me. Okay, going back. One more time on this quote. Cosmology may look like a science, but it isn't a science. A basic tenet of science is that you can do repeatable experiments, and you can't do that in cosmology. Let's be careful where we put our faith and it's held firmly to Scripture. So what do we look at in this lesson? Well, the universe looks like it could be old. It looks like it could be young. Um, I believe the universe was created mature. And no matter what dating method that you use, if it's especially on rocks that we didn't see form, that we think we're here on the early earth, we're going to get it wrong. It's just, it's a supernatural event. We, we're not going to be able to get the right dating method on there unless we consider a biblical worldview going into it to begin with. And some scientists do. Not enough. And then the most important thing is when you buy into the long ages of time, because, hey, time can do anything. Time can do anything God can do, right? Just give it enough time. Then you've got this idea of death, disease, struggle, famine, uh, cancer, and, and things eating each other uh, all throughout the history of life up until the first human being. And now you've undermined the very reason for Christ to come in the flesh and die a physical death. This, the only thing that makes sense is that death came after God's very good creation. Well, I appreciate your attention. I look forward to our next time together. Thank you.